Imagine for a moment that you're in New York City and you're in a subway station and you're waiting for a train. Now perhaps you're there with a friend and you're having a conversation with your friend. You know that off in the distance there's a train approaching the station because you can feel the vibration on the floor. And you know that there will come a point where you and your friend will no longer be able to communicate with each other. Now you have a few options. You can try to talk about it. So what you just experienced is an example of what's called acoustic masking. It's a very simple principle. The idea is you're having a conversation with somebody and a noise comes in which is louder than your conversation and it obscures or masks your ability to communicate. Now this happens to us all the time and gradually over the years our world has become noisier and noisier. Now humans that are exposed to chronic noise experience a myriad of health problems including general annoyance, cardiovascular effects and chronic stress. But people usually don't consider how animals respond to chronic noise, and in particular, how animals in the ocean might respond. Because our oceans are getting noisier too. Between the marine tourism industry, construction, oil and gas exploration, and shipping, humans have truly industrialized the oceans. And as a result, we have added a tremendous amount of noise to the marine environment. Now, some people may not care that the oceans are getting noisier. In fact, some may not care about the ocean in general. But I care. I'm a marine scientist, and I, when I look at this image, I see a beautiful blue planet. I know that the ocean keeps our entire Earth in balance. It plays a critical role in global cycles of energy, water, carbon, and climate. But underlying these inherently complex cycles lies one simple truth. We are all connected. We are all one. And this connectedness should drive our management of the world's oceans. Now, as a marine scientist today, we have our work cut out for us. We face many challenges, including overfishing, oil and uh, gas spills, plastic pollution, and global climate change. But there's one issue that people really aren't talking about, which I hope to bring to light today, and that issue is anthropogenic or human-generated noise. Over the last few years, I've traveled the world's oceans and become acquainted with some of its most magnificent creatures. And all the while, I've been listening. So what does the ocean sound like? What you're hearing now is the recording I made on a reef right here in Florida. And those snap, crackle, pop sounds you hear are the collective voices of thousands of marine animals as they go about their daily business. Now, marine animals use sounds just the way terrestrial animals do to find food, to find mates, and to defend territory. But sound in the ocean is particularly useful for two reasons. First, most of the ocean is dark, so your visual sense really doesn't get you very far. And second, sound travels nearly five times faster in water than it does in air, which makes the ocean an excellent place to communicate acoustically. Now, the most famous example of acoustic communication in the ocean is, of course, the song of the whale. But the truth is, we know almost nothing about how the other 99% of life in the ocean communicates. In fact, the field of marine bioacoustics today is truly an unexplored frontier. So today I want to tell you about a discovery I made a few years ago about an animal called the California mantis shrimp. Now, mantis shrimp are related to crabs, lobsters, and ordinary shrimp, except these are not ordinary shrimp. They are fierce, predatory shrimp because they possess a pair of highly specialized claws at the front of their body, which they use to smash their prey or anybody that gets in their way. They're capable of generating forces thousands of times their body weight, and these animals are about a foot long. So pound for pound, they're one of the strongest and most aggressive animals in the ocean, which makes them both fascinating and dangerous research subjects. But the reason that I am so fascinated by them is because they produce sound. So let's go for a dive into the kelp forest of California, which is the habitat of these mantis shrimp. Now, as you can see, this is a very dark, cold, murky environment. Here you can see a mantis shrimp out and about, walking around, probably searching for food. But actually, seeing them out like this is very rare, because these animals really are homebodies. They spend most of their time inside their burrows. So they dig these burrows, which extend several meters into the ocean floor. And it takes them quite a lot of time and energy to build the burrows, so they defend them fiercely. Now, during most of the year, the males and the females reside in separate burrows. But during one very special time of year, which is the mating season, the males recruit females to their burrows. And the two animals live together for several weeks. 
and then after they've mated, they go their separate ways. So the males are particularly aggressive during this time of year. In fact, intruder males have been seen evicting resident males from their burrows when there's a female inside. So this is a very dynamic time of year, and we wanted to know what role sounds might play in this mating system. So first, we deployed an audio video system, which is pictured here in front of a mantis shrimp burrow circled in red. And this black cable here is an underwater microphone or a hydrophone. So what did we find? Well, we found that the mantis shrimp produce very low frequency sounds, which we call rumbles, and they sound like this. OK, so I realize you probably were only able to hear the very high frequency clanging sound of the mooring balls in the harbor where we made this recording. And that's because that was an unfiltered clip. But now I'm going to play for you a filtered clip. So what you're looking at is a visual representation of the sound you just heard. So on the top here, we have the amplitude or the volume of the sound over time. And on the bottom, we have what's called a spectrogram. And you can read that like a musical score. So on the vertical axis, we have the frequency or the pitch of the sound. On the horizontal axis, we have time. And the brighter the color, the louder the sound. So we found that these mantis shrimp produce these rumbles in groups of twos, threes, or fours, which we call rumble groups. So this is a rumble group consisting of four rumbles. And listen carefully, I'll play it one more time. Hopefully you'll be able to hear these four distinct pulses of sound. Each one of those is a rumble, and collectively they make up a rumble group. So it seems that these mantis shrimp have a sense of rhythm. Now we noticed that there were certain times where we would hear these distinct rumble groups occurring within several seconds of one another. So here's an example where we have three rumble groups. Group A has four rumbles, Group B has two, and it's slightly quieter and higher in frequency. And then group C is somewhere in the middle. So listen carefully, and hopefully you'll be able to hear these three distinct rumble groups. So after hearing examples like this, we wondered, well, is this multiple animals making these sounds, or could this be one individual making these sounds? So we took a closer look at our data, and here we've zoomed out to 70 seconds in time, where you can see this alternation back and forth between rumble groups A, B, A, B, A, B, until about 45 seconds when they begin to overlap one another. So listen carefully now for the alternation and eventual overlap of these two rumble groups. So this overlap is very compelling evidence that this is multiple individuals making these sounds. And the reason is because they produce the sounds through a pair of muscles located at the front of their body. And we find it highly unlikely that one individual could, could independently control those two muscles to produce sounds that differ in their pitch and their loudness and that overlap one another. So it seems that each mantis shrimp has its own voice and its own sense of rhythm, and they communicate in this call and response sort of manner. Now just imagine what would happen if a subway came through and interrupted this conversation. So another question we had with this research project is, how do the animals use sounds at different times of day? So to answer this question, we deployed a passive acoustic recorder. We anchored it to the bottom of the ocean, and we let it record continuously for a week. What we found is that the mantis shrimp were most acoustically active at dawn and dusk, where we would hear these rumble groups repeated in series, lasting minutes to hours. And here's one example where you can hear multiple individuals making sound at the same time. So we could call this a mantis shrimp chorus. So every day as the sun rises and sets over this one harbor in California, these rumble choruses emanate from the mud. This is analogous to the way that the forest fills with bird song at dawn. Now, chorusing has been well studied in animals like frogs, insects, and birds, but nobody had ever found something like this before in a crustacean. So in order to put our results into context and to understand them a bit better, we have to look to the terrestrial literature. 
And although we have more work to do before we can truly understand the function of these rumbles, I do want to propose a few hypotheses today. So first, it could be that the rumble serves as a mating signal. From the safety of their burrows, the females could be listening and could make a decision about which male to mate with based on his acoustic qualities. It's also possible that the rumble serves as a territory defense signal. Remember, these animals have very powerful claws and they can inflict quite a lot of damage on one another. So it makes sense that they would have evolved a way to assert themselves acoustically in order to avoid physical damage. Now, in order for these messages to be successfully sent and received, these animals depend on some degree of acoustic space or acoustic habitat. And in the examples I've provided so far, the mantis shrimp are the only thing occupying that acoustic space. But now I want to provide a more realistic picture. So let's say we have these two mantis shrimp calling back and forth, and then a boat comes through and it revs its engine. shrimp are probably thinking, what is going on? And the truth is, we don't know what's going on during this time either. We don't know whether the mantis shrimp tried to make a louder sound, whether maybe they stopped making sound, or whether they continued to make sound and the rumbles were simply masked by the boats. But when we take a look at these sounds individually, we can learn a bit more. So here we're looking at a plot of the intensity or the frequency of the sound, uh, or loudness of the sound across the frequency band in which they communicate. You can see that the mantis shrimp louder, uh, rumbles are louder than the background noise. You can also see that the boats are substantially louder than the mantis shrimp rumbles, and that tells us that they are indeed capable of masking their sounds. Now, unfortunately, this is probably an all too common phenomenon for these mantis shrimp. This is a seven day snapshot of the acoustic habitat of these animals. The mantis shrimp choruses appear as these blobs of yellow, and all of the vertical lines that you see are boats that are passing through. In particular, these big red lines are tanker ships, which are coming or going from the port of Long Beach, located about 12 miles away. And they sound like this. So these boats are analogous to the subways of the ocean. And the million dollar question is, how do these mantis shrimp respond to this kind of noise? Well, for now, we don't know the answer to that question. However, a number of recent studies have shown direct effects of anthropogenic noise on animals such as bats, birds, mountain goats, and whales. And some of the effects include changes in habitat use, decreased foraging success, and decreased mating success. In this study, we discovered an entirely new system of acoustic communication in the most unsuspecting of animals, a shrimp living in the mud. To me, this kind of discovery serves as an inspiration and a revelation. Just imagine what we could discover if we went out there and listened to some of these other animals. And imagine the consequences if they too are exposed to chronic noise. So let's say you're an animal living in the ocean and you're singing your heart out all day to try to find a mate and you have this noise in your environment, well, there's a cost associated with that noise, and that cost is lost mating potential. Now, if you can't mate, you can't reproduce, and if a whole species can't reproduce, we could lose the species. But unfortunately, this isn't the only stressor we're putting on these animals. They also face things like bottom trawling, overfishing, and global climate change, and collectively, these are the cumulative stressors we're putting on animals living in today's oceans. This is their reality. And these are big problems they face. But I want to highlight the fact that anthropogenic noise really has not been a part of the conversation. And it really should be, because these animals depend upon acoustic space for basic everyday functions. And the good news is that there is a solution, which is to build sh quieter ships. It is possible, it just takes time and money to do so. But in the meantime, those of us in this room can help to alleviate some of these other stressors by helping to implement marine protected areas, eating more sustainably caught fish, and cutting back on our carbon emissions. And together, we need to do everything we can to turn back the scale. And it is critically important that we do, because the loss of just one species, no matter how small, can alter the delicate balance of our ocean's food chains, which would have disastrous consequences. Life on the ocean sustains life on the entire planet. 
It provides the air we breathe and the food we eat. And as the most intelligent and most powerful species on this planet, it is our obligation to do everything we can for all of the other species, large and small. Thank you.